Hello everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am going to take you in depth into the start to finish editing process of my debut novel, Brightly Burning. I've gotten this question a lot of how much did the book change from your first draft to the final published copy. So I thought it would be really fun and super illustrative to go all the way through it in great detail, telling you exactly what things changed. So this is going to be full of spoilers. Don't watch this video unless you've read the book or you don't care about being spoiled about the book because I'm going to talk specifically about a lot of the twists that changed, the ending, who dies versus who doesn't die, all that kind of stuff, and what the thought process was behind each of the rounds of edits that I did. These are the edits I had to do before I queried, the edits I had to do once I had an agent, the edits I had to do between submission rounds to sell the book. I'm going to go over it all. So for starters, the first draft of Brightly Burning was 104,000 words, and I wrote it in three months. I wrote every single day save one or two from November, the beginning of NaNoWriMo, through to the very end of January, like edging into the beginning of February 2016. I actually got stuck right before the end of the book, not the first time this has happened, this has become part of my writing process, where I'll get within a few chapters of the ending and I just get a little bit stuck, but I already know all of the edits that I want to make to the first draft, essentially to make the book a first draft, because I am a pantser. I figure a lot of things out as I go along. And so I went back to the beginning before I had technically finished the draft, my draft zero, and I started editing, revising things that I knew needed to be fixed. So my first round of revision and the edits I'm going to talk about are essentially the things that I threw out before technically even finishing my first draft. So first of all, Stella originally had three engineering colleagues. If you've read the book, you know she has two. There's Jatinder, her boss, and there's John. In the original, there was a third colleague named Constance. This was my attempt to give Stella friends, and not just friends, but a strong female friend on board the stalwart because that's something that's really important to me. But a key critique partner pointed out overall in the book, I had character soup. I had too many characters in lots of different places, and they weren't contributing anything substantial to the plot. In many cases, they showed up, did some stuff, and then disappeared. So I had to make some hard choices in terms of cutting characters. I'd say in the first draft revision, these were the largest edits that I I made. So poor Constance had to go. I took all of her best one-liners, I gave them to John, and the reason I chose John over Constance is as I had been drafting the novel. So originally George was meant to be Sinjin, a major character in Jane Eyre, but over time John turned into Sinjin, so I knew that John had to stay because he became very important in the third act of the book. So that's why poor Constance had to go. Similarly, I cut a staff member from the Rochester. Originally, Orion actually had a husband on the Rochester. His name is Sebastian, but Sebastian didn't really contribute to the plot in any significant way, and Orion needed to be there because there needed to be a technical officer, and it became a question of either Orion or Sebastian stays. One of them got to stay to fill the role of technical officer, so I ended up cutting poor dear Sebastian. But this is why Orion ends up moving to the Lady Liberty at the end of the book, and I indicate that he's dating someone, and that is Sebastian. So in my heart and my mind, Sebastian lives. He just moved to another ship, and I like pushed their romance back a little bit, because I, I, I love them as a couple. The couple that in only like two people have ever read, because only my original critique partners read that character. But that is another one who had to go. There was also an additional Ingram maid when the Ingram party comes to the Rochester, and same thing. She wasn't performing any particular function. I had way too many people on the Ingram staff period, so just it was pretty easy to cut her and just merge some of the lines and function into other characters. Speaking of characters and cutting them from the book, I did actually briefly consider getting rid of George at this point, because as I mentioned, he was supposed to be Sinjin, but John turned into Sinjin, and I thought, well, George is kind of 
inert in the third act. He wasn't really serving a function. But instead of cutting George, I did revisions to give him more of a purpose in the book so that I could keep him. Because something in my heart told me, eh, keep him around. And I'm, I'm pretty glad I did because weirdly he's kind of the Helen of the book. He's also gender. So um, I'm glad that I kept George around. So the other big thing that happened in this draft zero revision, as I call it, in order to finish the first draft of the book. So I hit about the 60% mark of the draft as I was pantsing it and I came up with a large secondary mystery. So I knew that there was a central mystery because it's Jane Eyre. Someone's in the attic. I knew that. But I also knew that it wasn't enough. There needed to be something larger and broader going on, but I didn't know when I started the book what that was. This is sci-fi, so government conspiracies are a trope. They're pretty par for the course. So I came up with the virus plot as I was working on the book. And so to that end, when I did that draft zero revision to finish it, I went back to the beginning to try to drop in foreshadowing for this thing so it didn't hit the reader out of nowhere. But bookmark that because I didn't necessarily succeed, but we're gonna come back to that. So the main takeaway for the first revision I did, which was to finish the book, and I did, I basically got to the part, caught up with myself, and then finished the book. And it's more or less the ending that exists today. I didn't really make many changes to the very end of the book uh, in any of my edit passes. It kind of lives as it was, more or less, uh, for better or worse. The main takeaway, condensing characters, streamlining things, taking things out, trying to get rid of anything that wasn't significantly contributing to the plot or character relationships or character arcs. I think it's a pretty common thing to do this, especially if you are less of a planner. You basically create characters to do things as you need them in the moment, but you then have to really critically examine how much is this character actually contributing to the book and you either have to make them more significant or write them out. And so then I did the thing that I tell all of you not to do. I queried pretty quickly after finishing the book because I had basically done my first revision while finishing. So I queried in early February, and then I was super fortunate to get two offers of representation five weeks later, and I signed with Alana Roth Parker in April of 2016. So let's talk about my first real big revision. You know, book is done, I have distance from it, and I'm now working with my agent to revise it for submission. So these are the things I did in that big revision pass. I'd say this revision pass and then the one I did in between submission rounds are the two most significant revisions I did to this book. So first of all, my wonderful agent let me know that I hadn't threaded the mystery through the book as well as I had hoped. I did essentially a patch job and I will confess, I kind of knew that and I think a lot of us do this. We realize we've done something, we need foreshadowing, we need to build to something and we do we do a quick fix, we do a patch job, and we hope no one catches us. And the good thing is uh, my agent signed me despite this and we worked together to basically fix it. Now my agent left it totally up to me how I was gonna fix it. And this is what I ended up coming up with. So first of all, in the original draft, Grace Poole was more or less the same red herring as exists in Jane Eyre. I wrote her as a carbon copy of Grace Poole from Jane Eyre, and one of my agent's notes was she's really not working as a red herring. Because first of all, anyone who's read Jane Eyre is going to be bored because they already know that Grace Poole isn't actually a bad guy, and so she advised that I remove that entirely. But I needed someone to be a catalyst for Stella being suspicious of things and to spur on her investigation. I also needed to foreshadow the entire virus plot. So originally there was a character on the crew who was a medical officer. Her name was Marigold Lee, and she didn't do much. She was kind of there, much like I knew the ship needed a technical officer, and that's why Orion existed. Um, and I changed her, I morphed her into Mari Hanada, and I gave her an active role in the broader conspiracy. I introduced her much earlier than the previous iteration of her character had been, and I gave her a direct character thread and arc that intersected with Stella and steadily built the mystery. So this is the revision where basically I invented that character and threaded her through the whole book. The other huge change I made in terms of threading this mystery through better 
What's funny is that technically it was a small change, but it made a big difference. And my advice to aspiring writers, to writers, is to look for these places. Very often the key to having something work better in your novel is just finding the right spot, particularly and especially in act one, to insert something that's going to set up whatever this important arc is. And for me, that was inserting the memorial scene at the very beginning on board the stalwart. This enabled me to bring in world building backstory that references the previous virus that introduced key characters like Mason. Previously, he hadn't been introduced in until the middle of the book, much like Jane Eyre. And this way I was able to actually thread in like a backbone of kind of the history and the politics in a much better way. In the first draft, it was just a concert. It was a piano concert. So instead I changed it to the memorial and then the dance party. And that one change, I think the memorial is only a few pages. It changed everything. It also enabled me to much better utilize John and kind of put forth clearly what his political views were, so to speak, and start building up the conspiracy aspect involving John. Which dovetailed into another major change. So the book always had George writing messages to Stella, but in this revision I added John writing to Stella as well as a way to keep him connected to the story and the characters and gradually build the conspiracy virus aspect of the plot. So the other thing that I had to do in this big revision is make a decision about my writing style. So in the very first iteration of the book, when I was drafting, in the interest of letting myself figure out what the book was, I wrote in two different styles. I wrote in a very kind of modern YA type style, which is what the book is now for the most part. And very often I slipped into what I would call old timey language. There were huge flaws of the book where I went super Jane Eyre on things essentially. I was very inspired by the source material and a lot of the ways in which people spoke to each other, especially Hugo with Stella. Uh, it was just kind of that antiquated quasi literary style. And my agent said, pick. Either do this as the kind of old fashioned Jane Eyre style and try to push this more literary or go all the way making it more of a modern commercial YA. She left it open to me, but I knew in my heart the right thing to do. And I know she and her professional opinion also knew the right thing to do, but I appreciate that she let me come to the answer, which was, it was a commercial fast paced novel and the tone needed to match that. So another part of this huge revision pass was refining my language. Any place I had characters slipping into too much of an old fashioned dialect I had to change it. This mostly impacted, as I mentioned, scenes on the Rochester with Hugo and Stella and also Bianca. Um, in this section, I leaned the most heavily kind of on the inspiration and the source material of kind of the Jane Eyre, Bronte, or even Austin-esque style. I fell into that style. The other thing I did that played into this because I did have to end up rewriting so much of the dialogue between Stella and Hugo is I reworked almost every romantic scene. And this has actually turned into a trend that I have done on more than one book at this point because I write romances and so the romance arc is as important if not more important than any other arc in the story, plot arc in the story, character growth arc. So. I really focused on each and every romantic interaction, how they built on each other in order to hopefully lead to a satisfying romance read. So on this revision, I tweaked and or completely changed all the romance interactions, kind of the, the exchanges that they had, etc. And it wasn't the last time I tweaked or rewrote the romance scenes. We'll talk more about that later. Something I should have mentioned, I did end up querying my book at 99,000. 800 words. So in that first draft zero to one revision, I got it down from 104k to 99.8 for querying. And then in this revision with my agent, I shaved it down to about 96,000 words for submission. So we went on submission with the book in September of 2016. And if you know my book deal story, I can link to it down below. I didn't sell on my first round of submission. I was on submission in the first round from September to February. And at the beginning of February, unfortunately, the last editor passed. I went to acquisitions and did not get through acquisitions. And so it came the time for my agent and I to sit down, 
literally kind of, we had a phone call and we went through all of the feedback we'd received from every single rejection. I looked for patterns, she looked for patterns, and we talked about what we saw. And this is where I was so thankful for my agent's professional guidance because she is the professional and she was able to read between the lines in ways that I wasn't able to. And we narrowed it down to three focus areas to work on for another semi-major revision. The first one was pacing. We got a lot of passes that indicated that it was too slow in the beginning. What was really tricky about this is I'd already targeted that area for pacing. Alana and I had worked on it before and Jane Eyre is a more slowly paced novel. If you actually look at Jane Eyre, she doesn't meet Rochester until almost halfway through the book. And so there had to be a buildup of my character starting in one place, escaping that place, going to a new place. It had to be a little bit creepy and she couldn't meet the love interest right away. But essentially my inciting incident technically is when she gets the job on the Rochester, but really for a romance, the inciting incident is when she meets Hugo. And that wasn't happening until almost page 100 in the book. So I had to do a pretty intense pacing edit. And this is when my agent gave me the most useful tip I think I've ever received in terms of revision. And what she told me to do, she said to look for places where I had long paragraphs, long sentences, anywhere in the manuscript that someone's eye might trip over, is the way she put it, anywhere where they might have to pause to read something again, where they might stop. And she said, trim those places down. It wasn't about cutting anything essential because she and I both agreed every single beat I had in the first act was essential. We didn't want to get rid of anything. It wasn't about drastically rewriting that part of the book, just trimming it down. And so I followed her advice and it was a game changer for me. I managed to cut 6,000 words of the first 18,000 words. This moved Stella meeting Hugo up much closer to about the 70 page mark in Microsoft Word. And it really was the game changer. It improved the pacing markedly. I know some people still think it's too slow, to which I gesture wildly and say, it's Jane Eyre, I did the best I could. But I digress, that was the first really key edit that I did in that revision round. The second thing we agreed I should focus on was the romance arc, again, essentially the middle. Alana's advice was to look at every single big romantic interaction with Hugo one more time to make sure it was unput downable, that it was really romantically compelling because the selling point should be the romance. It was a great note. Again, I looked at every major scene with them. I tweaked some of the dialogue and interactions, the quips. Some of my favorite lines that ended up in the book are ones that I rewrote on this revision pass. I rewrote the scene where they kissed for the first time. I rewrote so many of them and it was, ultimately they were subtle changes but they make a huge difference. And the big kind of game changing new thing I added in this revision is one of my favorite things in the novel. And that is the section of the book where they play hide and go seek in the dark. <laughs> I loved that part. I loved writing it and it just added another really concrete romantic scene in the middle of the book that kind of, you know, makes your stomach dip and your heart zing a little. Um, and I, I think that is one of the most important revisions I've ever made. One of my better ideas. Um, I'm really proud of that change and I, I think it made a huge difference. And then the third thing I focused on in this revision was reconceptualizing my third act. Alana and I talked about it. It was pretty quickly paced. It was pretty page turning, but it could be taken to the next level. We both agreed. The first major note she gave me was, there need to be higher stakes. Someone needs to die. And I'll tell you at first, I was resistant to this because I thought it was a cheap tactic, a cheap ploy to just kill someone. And maybe it is, but I really thought about the note. I thought about the way that the third act was structured and the stakes as they existed at that time. And I agreed with her. They were decently high, but they could definitely be higher. I also discovered some spots where I was basically narrating instead of dramatizing. And I now have a whole video on that. In hindsight, I can pinpoint that that's what I was doing. It was sections where I was transitioning 
for the quarantine that happens in the third act, where I was transitioning from basically act two to act three with narration. I wasn't showing or doing anything dramatic or compelling to show what has been going on and the characters and how they change. So this was the revision where I basically cut a few chapters. I actually cut a few of needless dramatization, where I had the gang on the stalwart talking about the, the virus and the vaccine and quarantine, and I realized I didn't actually need it, so I cut that. And then I changed a very long section of transition narration, and I changed it to dramatization of that transition scene, the new scene that exists there, where they're working the fields and they have rolling blackouts. And it was a much better way to show where the characters and their relationships had landed and, you know, kind of be like, and they're, they've been under quarantine. And this brings me to the biggest change I made in the third act, the game-changing change that I made in the third act. And this is me telling you that sometimes you have to throw out what you have because it's not that it's bad, it's just that it can be better. So originally, the gang went to the Lady Liberty to look for Hugo. They don't find him, They and they rush down to Earth to find him because Stella's worried about him. It was pretty linear. The stakes were all based on Stella loves Hugo. They were all essentially uh, romantic characters driven stakes. And I basically tweaked it. So in this revision, I changed it to Stella being a fugitive, coming back to the stalwart, Mason showing up, arresting her, throwing her in jail. And let's talk a little bit about beats. The irony being one of my favorite beats on the beat sheet is The Dark Knight of the Soul. And my previous drafts of this book didn't really have one. It didn't have the sniff of death either, which is another beat I love. And so this is the revision where I added both of those things. And they transformed the third act. The stakes were ratcheted sky high of active life or death stakes for Stella. It added a ticking clock to them needing to escape the stalwart and go down to earth. It just increased the tension in the third act by a million. And then this brings me to the biggest change I made in this revision that didn't make it to the final draft of the book, but I might shock some of you. In this revision of the book, the version of the book that sold to my publisher, I murdered George. George died from that gunshot that he suffers. The gunshot is still there, but he died in this revision. And I ended up having to essentially address his death and Stella's grief in the end when she's on Earth. I'll talk about why I ended up reversing course on that in a minute, but yeah. In this revision, in the version that sold, George died. And many people were cheering. <laughs> many of my critique partners were so happy. Uh, but we'll get to why I changed it back in a minute. Another important thing to know about this revision is in this version and the previous ones, Hugo had a higher degree of culpability in the virus than he does in the final version of the book. He had a level of awareness of what was going on on the Rochester and what Mari Hinata was doing that I did end up changing. So let's talk about selling this book and the final, final changes I made to the book that is basically as it exists right now. So I did this major revision. I did it in 10 days. I had to like wind under my butt. I was like chomping at the bit. I was like, I'm going to kick butt on this revision. I'm going to do it really fast. I'm going to do it really well. And then my agent's going to sell this book. We were both like so motivated to like make it happen. So even though I cut 6k in the beginning of the book, I refined and added things. So the word count more or less didn't change. We went on submission at the beginning of March 2017. And four weeks later, I had a book deal. That revision, that 10 day angry at the world revision where I'd made some pretty drastic changes, particularly to the third act. Like I said, it was the magical revision that sold the book. I finally figured out how to fix everything, things that I hadn't even realized were broken. And so that leads me to the final developmental edit, the final revision I ended up doing on Brightly Burning before it hit bookshelves. And this is the edit that I did with my editor. So she got me an edit letter about two weeks after we sold the book and her biggest notes. One, George was one of her favorite characters <laughs> and she was really sad that he died. But not only that, she made a really astute observation about the emotional impact of the very end of the book. And she said that it 
was a bit of emotional whiplash to have Stella go from processing grief over losing her best friend to a romantic reunion with Hugo. And she was correct. She was absolutely right. And so that is the reason why soon after they land, they hear the news. I cheated a little with communications. That's why they immediately hear that George is going to be okay. That was to absolve Stella of having to grieve before her big re reunion with Hugo. So that's why that ended up changing. That's one thing I did. The other uh, thing that she, my editor had a question about that I ended up tweaking. She didn't quite understand Stella's specific motivation to go to the Lady Liberty to look for Hugo. And that is why there is now Sergei delivering a letter to Stella where Hugo tries to explain everything and tell her that he loves her. This becomes her motivation for going to the Lady Liberty um, and sets things up nicely, a nice romantic letter. So that was a little tweak I made, but it completely alleviated my editor's feeling that she didn't have a strong enough reason to risk everything to go to the Lady Liberty for Hugo. The other thing I ended up adding, there is a chapter toward the end of the book, uh, the transition chapter, where you get uh, private messages and newspaper articles about what was going on during quarantine with the group messaging with Mason and the newspaper reports that explained how, you know, Hugo became a, hu a, f a fugitive and kind of how those things unfolded. Um, and that was my way of basically explaining what had gone on during quarantine without having that big info dumping transition I had originally had in the previous iteration. So I did that kind of breaking format section with the newspaper articles and the messages um, to bridge that gap. I also liked that I was able to use that to show readers a little little bit of Mason and his motivation um, and kind of saying, you know, block them from communications, which was another motive for Stella having to go to the Lady Liberty. She couldn't just message uh, Lady Liberty. So that was a small change that I think made a big difference. And to that end, about the letter um, and the newspaper reports, especially the letter, the team at my publisher were split. I was told that there were debates of whether or not what Hugo did was forgivable as the romantic lead of the book, um, being aware that a virus was being developed on his ship. He had a higher level of awareness in this incarnation of the book. And the reason in the final that he di didn't know, uh, I changed it so that he was basically in the dark right up until Mason's visit when things were more or less a done deal um, in order to basically make it possible that readers wouldn't absolutely hate him. Um, so I cast a bit more of blame onto Hanada, but it was also in this revision that I made it very clear that she was also being blackmailed because um, I, you know, that she, she was developing viruses. She knew what she was doing, but she wasn't developing them to use for evil. She was then blackmailed. So that was kind of like little changes I made um, so that, you know, to, to, to make the character arts go down a little more smoothly. Another thing I changed to the third act, and you're noticing a pattern, most of my changes were to the third act. Um, I had a lengthy scene of Stella going to Captain Carlson for help, but when I introduced the letter and the transition chapter with the newspaper articles and the messages, that scene became really dead weight. So I want to offer that as an example of you can really like a scene, and I really liked that scene, and you just gotta let it go. Uh, because it's not working anymore. I ended up really cutting that down. So now it's a pretty minor scene in the book, but it was the right choice to make for the book so that the pacing didn't slow down and there wasn't repetition of information. Okay, moving backwards. I did make some changes to the middle of the book. My editor wanted a stronger first meeting between Hugo and Stella, something that sparked a bit more. She wanted a little bit more romantic tension, like a little more back and forth, because of course that's an essential part of Jane and Rochester's relationship. So I ended up rewriting their first meeting again. I think it ended up being the third or fourth time I had rewritten it. And that is when I came up with one of my favorite interactions in the book, and that is when Hugo insults Stella's name. I love this change. I'm really proud of it. Um, just kind of, it, it got them off on a more of a spark, kind of almost hate to love, not quite footing. Um, and so I love that scene. And that was 100% my editor saying, hey, can you try something different? And I'm so glad that I did. And then my editor also wanted me to add more context 
for Stella's upbringing with her aunt. Essentially, flashbacks without being flashbacks. She just wanted the reader to have more of that because that is such an essential part of Jane Eyre, but I had to cut so much of that because in Jane Eyre, um, the almost the entire first act is deep childhood flashback moving into her adolescence. So I added a few key points of flashback to contextualize her relationship with her aunt and her cousins. And they were small changes, but I think they made a huge difference. So really this edit that I did with my editor, it was about context, backstory, refining and tightening character arcs and motivations and making some changes in the third act so that the pacing and the emotional build landed better. Whew, so that's it. All of the revisions I did on Brightly Burning. So if you count draft zero, so that's when I went back to the beginning before I was quite done and did some decently major revisions. I did four rounds of revision on this book and I would consider two of them major. Uh, Cause I, the first one I did, the draft zero to one was kind of in hindsight minor and the final developmental edit I did with my editor was comparatively minor because the two previous revisions were so major. And a huge part of what I did, you know, kind of reflecting on, on all the revisions I did in the book. So many times it was tweaking, rewriting, revising a scene where it had the same kind of skeleton, but I moved the organs around. I love that metaphor. Or it had the same DNA, but I added some strands of DNA to make it stronger DNA. I don't know. Um, ultimately, the, the, the soul of the book and the structure of the book never really changed, but I, I just kind of rearranged and tightened and tweaked things. Really probably the biggest big change was to act three and act three was the least firmly structured because act three is the act where I most strongly diverted from Jane Eyre. So that's really where like the most game changing changes definitely happened. Um, but overall it was a lot of kind of looking at what wasn't working, mystery arcs, character arcs, romance build, and just diving in there, throwing stuff out and putting new stuff in. And now I want to talk about the things I didn't get to edit. <laughs> we all we all have vague regrets, but I also say don't regret things ever. Um, I'm kind of a no regrets kind of girl, but I thought it would be fun to talk about a few things I didn't end up doing, and they'll always be my what ifs. So the first one is that I entertained general notions of doing something more with Jessa. I had this idea that what if Jessa knew about her mother but didn't know about her mother? Because to my mind, Cassandra definitely had the ability to wander the ship. I mean, we know that she wanders the ship because she does creepy things like laughing outside doorways and lighting things on fire. And so I was thinking she would definitely go visit her daughter, Jessa. Um, and I had this idea of upping the creep factor by having Jessa tell Stella that there are ghosts on board and trying to really crank up the gothic ghost story aspect of it, but I could never figure out how to do it and so ultimately I didn't. Um, it's kind of a regret in the sense that I'm like, oh, the super gothic ghost story that never was. Um, and to that end, I, I feel like a novella from Jess's point of view would be quite interesting, uh, but that's one thing I didn't do. And overall, that kind of speaks to something. I We always have a vision for our book when we start it. We have like this ideal vision of like, this is what the book is gonna be. And very often we don't end up getting that. Sometimes we can revise it up to what we want it to be, but sometimes it's also just like, well, that's not the book that it ended up being. And I love the book it is. And so I always had this idea that it would be creepier and more gothic and ultimately, I didn't make it creepy and gothic enough, I think, but I also like what it is, but regrets. Um, and then the only other thing, this isn't something concrete, but I will always wonder about the ending. Endings are just so hard and I'll always wonder, was it, was it too slow? Was it too fast? Some people love the epilogue and some people hate the epilogue. I like the epilogue, but I see why people hate the epilogue. And so there's always kind of the question mark of what if, but also I'm so proud of the book. I'm proud of where it started from like draft zero to where it ended up. I 
love some of the changes I made. Like I'm genuinely tickled and delighted and proud of hide and go seek in the dark. And I love the sequence where Stella thinks she's gonna die. I loved writing it. Um, I love reading it. I think it's just so like satisfying from a tension and suspense point of view. Um, I'm happy with the book. Uh, it is what it is. <laughs> and the healthiest thing you can do as a writer, now that we've done this lengthy postmortem, is to be proud of where you've come and everything you've done on a book, whether it is published or not. But also let it go because you can't wallow in regrets. And at a certain point, you just have to stop editing a book and let it be. So that's that's it. This is a long video, but you know this book went through so many changes and I wanted to do them all justice and really tell you what it was because I hope that this is instructive or inspirational, it gives you like ideas and sparks things where you go, oh, that's a huge change she made like and think about the problems in your book and maybe you have a similar brainwave. Um, I did learn some huge things from this. I learned the pacing edit my agent gave me that it's not necessarily about cutting things but trimming the, the literal prose on the page can make a huge difference for pacing. Um, I learned uh, about, you know, kind of taking myself to task for making sure I have the sniff of death and the dark night of the soul, being willing to push the conflict and the stakes hard enough. I, I think I basically, in my earlier drafts, I was wussing out on the stakes in the third act of the book and I had to basically kick myself in the pants and go, kill people, shoot people. Um, and that was that was huge for me. I think that's really helped me going forward on future books and kind of upping the stakes for myself. So um, yeah, every this is why every book is a learning experience, writing it, revising it, um, whether for querying, for publication, etc. So thank you so much for watching. If you've made it to the end, you deserve a medal. Um, let me know down below in the comments if you have any questions about this or you know any, anything that surprised you if you've read the book that I changed. Give this video a thumbs up if you like it. I will do another similar postmortem for The Stars We Steal. I'll have to wait until it's out because it would be chock full of spoilers, but that book went through even more of a journey than this one, so that'll be a very interesting video. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. Oh, thank you so much for watching. MVP is making it to the end. And as always, guys, happy writing.